next panel discussion. So we have uh, a number of esteemed scholars here with us today. Two of them uh, you've already met, Eibert and Mladen, who've given presentations. Um, three other scholars have decided to join us. We've invited them to join us. Sydney Crawford, uh, she's a professor at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. She's recently written a book called Scribes and Scrolls at Qumran. Uh, so she is well known as an expert in scribes in our period. Um, she's interested in the manuscripts, textual criticism, paleography, but uh, especially this whole question of scribal culture and how that, how that fits with the archeology span of Qumran and uh, the nature of scribes and the, the scrolls themselves. So Sydney is uh, a great expert to have on our panel. Uh, and as she's expressed, coming from the humanity side, not the math side. So it's very nice to have uh, her input there. Uh, Bill Schneiderwind is also a professor at UCLA. And he also has recently written a book on scribal culture and education called The Finger of the Scribe. Uh, Bill works primarily or has worked largely on the uh, earlier Iron Age materials, but he's also done a fair amount of work in Qumran and or Gemma, for instance, has uh, interacted with his work on orthography and things like that. So uh, also a common name in our project here. So it's a pleasure to have both of those. And to round off the discussions, um, we have asked Hindi Nyman, professor at University of Oxford and a close friend of both Groningen and Leuven. It is a pleasure to have her on board. She speaks with great authority on broad questions in the humanities and theory and method. And uh, she, we were hoping that she would be able to bring a very unique perspective, taking these nitty gritty paleography questions and scribal questions and connecting them with uh, broader concerns in human knowledge. So I want to open up the discussion. Uh, I'll ask Sydney if you're online and available. If you just take a couple of minutes if you have any thoughts that come to you about the conference, about the current state of things, and to reflect on that and any takeaways. Thanks very much, Drew. Um, it, all during this conference, I've been reminded um, of the archaeological uh, mantra that you never fully excavate a site because the next generation will have new tools and techniques that will reveal more about what is there. And I think that we're entering a kind of brave new world with new tools that can give us new information about the scrolls. Um, and it's very exciting. And another thing that I think this conference brought out so strongly is that collaboration across disciplines is now not even desirable, but essential to carry on our work, as well as collaboration in a sense, chronologically. I was delighted to hear um, from people who work in the Cairo Geniza, from people who are uh, medievalists and work in medieval manuscripts. Um, and I think blessed are the medievalists for they have a huge corpus of manuscripts <laughs> uh, when we think of the scrolls. Um, and, and so uh, in those, uh, we have really exciting possibilities about what we can learn. Um, and I wanted to say a word here about my uh, late revered teacher, Frank Moore Cross, because his name came up in many of the talks as one of the original paleographers of the scrolls. And what people may not know about Frank is that he had a science background as well. He was a chemistry major in college. And so he brought a scientific mind to a humanities discipline and he would be fascinated by what is going on. <laughs> and he would be delighted, I think, to see a new generation of paleographers being trained with the latest tools. So uh, I just wanted to say that. Um, I think that while we have all these exciting uh, new tools and possibilities, 
Um, we need also to bear in mind what Professor Dershowitz said and what Ma Michelle Langlois said, uh, reminded us that the computers are our assistants. I like that new term. The computer is our, our, are our assistants. And we receive new data and scientific results that then must be interpreted. And so the fundamental task that we've always undertaken as scholars of the scrolls or whatever corpus we study still remains the same, the interpretation of the data we get. And our data is growing and we're learning new things and we're able to ask new questions of that new data and that's wonderful. But I think the fundamental task remains the same. I also wanted to say a few things about um, typology. And I really appreciated uh, Professor Olshovsi Schlanger's lecture um, in yesterday, um, because she really brought out, I thought so clearly, the difference between typology and individual hands. Um, typology, um, refers to scripts as a corpus, as she said. And it it's, it's looks at, at scripts in their development broadly over time. And so typological dates can shift back and forward as the corpus expands and our knowledge expands. What if we suddenly got a document with a date on it? Well, that would help us a lot, right? If we could maybe shift our typology. And so when people look at script charts, in a sense, they're not perhaps quite understanding how a script chart is meant to be used. It's not, you're not to look at it and match the letter forms. You're to look at how Olive, for example, develops over time. Um, and, and try and place your individual hand within that development as best you can. Um, a, an individual hand, a, a hand belongs to an individual scribe. And so each scribe has their own quirks, uh, given whatever their training was. Um, they could make really archaic looking olives, but make a very contemporary, to, so to speak, tav. And, and so again, when you're looking at the quirks of an individual scribe, um, you have to take those into account. But this is what struck me as, as what the work that, um, that the Groningen project is doing is so helpful with it. I was especially struck with um, in, Gemma in Gemma's paper about this, that um, you know, she could look at the scribes of, uh, of that Yardani had identified and say, well, no, if we really look at the details, then we only get eight manuscripts. And by the way, Gemma, I think you should name your scribe. It's boring just to have a number. So you, can, you should name him. Um, We've debated <laughs> about that. <laughs> and then finally, I wanted to say a word about the whole question of the scribal context of Qumran. Now we have material evidence from archeology span and from the text that there were scribes working at Qumran okay, we can, in the second temple period. So we can say that, but can we say how many were there at any given time? No, we can't. We don't know the answer to that. Were some of them apprentices? Perhaps. Um, we have a little bit of evidence for that. Ibert's paper, I think, brought out that maybe we can look at that in, in more detail. And that's a wonderful question. Um, and so again, that kind of close work with the material remains of the scrolls can open up new ways for us to look at these questions. And I think that this, this conference brought those out in really exciting ways. And I was very happy to, to, uh, to sit in and participate over the last three days. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Sydney. It's been a pleasure to have you and I'm happy you 
had some good thought provoking times and thank you for your contribution here. I look forward to talking more. Uh, for now, I will turn it over to Bill, however. Uh, he was having some internet issues. So hopefully uh, it's up and working now. Bill, if it's a problem, you can also turn off your video. Are you there now? Yeah, I'm, I'm here now. Um, I, I lost you guys for a second, but I'm back. So let's hope uh, one of the disadvantages of Zoom is this would never happen. I'd never lose <laughs> contact with you in a real conference, right? Um, uh, so. And for me, Zoom fatigue is real because this conference started at four in the morning Pacific Standard Time. So, um, <clears throat> but I'm really honored to be here. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really honored to be here. Thank you, Drew and Malden, for for the invitation. Um, uh, the papers have been really fantastic. Um, so, as I was listening to uh, the papers, lots of different thoughts come to mind. Um, but one thing that came to mind over and over again for me is uh, the problem of data sets and understanding what your data set is. And sometimes the problem is that um, since for those of us who aren't medievalists, right, our data sets are really limited um, and they're often really poorly understood and sometimes disputed in terms of our, the context of understanding the data set. And understanding the data, what kind of data you're putting into something has an enormous impact on the output uh, and interpretation. Um, and let me just, um, I wanna give a few examples of this. And you know, I can begin perhaps by um, suggesting that we also need to prob problematize the term scribe. We use it sort of as a monolith. Um, but writing is often part of a pr profession, right? It's not always a profession itself. And sometimes, and writing was learned through apprenticeship, um, which had implications. And I, I just threw up a couple slides I just wanna share with you. Uh, let's see if I can share my screen. Um, to illustrate this problem. Let's see, am I going to be able to do this right? Um, so I'm interested in, um, that's not where I want to be. I'm interested, for example, in the data set from a place called Contil Rude. And it's important um, to know where we're talking about when you're talking about the data set. Um, this is a site that's in the middle of nowhere. It's in the desert. Um, and, uh, and yet you have scribal activity going on here. And I'll just give you a couple examples of things. Um, here's one jar in which you have scribal exercises. These are mostly abecedaries, but there's also lists and letter templates um, in this. And you start looking carefully at this um, one Li uh, set of lines and you see at least three different hands in lines one and four you seem to have two two different student hands in lines three five and six you seem to have the elegant script of a master scribe um, so you have and then you also have black and red ink which is illustrative of uh, typical Egyptian educational scribal rubrics so you you get this kind of complex thing going on you also have evidence of erasure and reuse of the jar. You see um, here the pay and uh, what looks like a yod um, uh, erased. The other thing that's interesting about Kuntiladaj Rud is that this is a military site. Uh, and these are military scribes. And this is, of course, illustrated by the fact that it's a, a fortress, but also uh, in one of the uh, plaster wall inscriptions, you have this very nice reconstruction that was done by, that I've adapted from uh, uh, Erhard Bloom. And um, in the top corner of this, I think that you have the expression na'are sar ir, that is the apprentices of the commander of the fortress. Um, 
So you have an illustration there of apprentices working at for um, someone with a military title. Um, and this is relevant. Um, uh, I bring this up because we talked about, uh, there are a number of, there are a couple of studies that have been done on the Arad uh, Ostraca and also on the Sumerian Ostraca. And I think that the, these studies are particularly problematic um, because at Arad, what we have is a military fortress. Um, and what kind of scribes do we have there? Uh, we have probably um, military scribes. These are not scribes. These are people who are learning to read and write through, um, through their profession, right? And the kinds of inscriptions that you get are mundane inscriptions. And it really doesn't speak anything to the conclusions of the studies that were done on Arad and Samaria because it speaks to the literacy in a community of, of a particular profession that is military. And this at Arad, I mean, it's probably stretched back all the way to the 10th, 9th century. We have um, Ostraca uh, from the, the 9th century and there's probably a continuation of literacy um, in all different periods uh, for this profession, right? Uh, or in the case of the Sumeria Ostraca, this is a totally different kind of place, right? This is uh, the cap. This is writing in the capital of a kingdom, right? It's writing uh, that's probably can almost contemporary with Kuntilatrud, but it's a government office, perhaps things that uh, recording receipt of goods in a um, in the government office. Uh, these people actually might be scribes, but they're probably actually professional bureaucrats and not scribes. And as such, I don't think that this contributes to broader questions about literacy or you know what kind of lit literature could be written uh, at this particular time because of, um, of this uh, the, 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 the data set we have is too small and restricted to address the problem that um, they wanted to address. And that brings me to my sort of final point and where I'm going in my current research in my book I'm working on now. And that is um, this notion of communities of practice and, uh, and the apprenticeship system. Um, and here I think about um, the data set again, you know, like for example, the Qumran data set, you know, what exactly is Qumran, the Qumran scrolls? Is it a Geniza? Are scrolls largely written at, at Qumran? Um, I think we need to be, move beyond the Qumran community as Collins and others have suggested. Um, and also think about the complexity of uh, the, uh, the, the data set of, of Qumran. Um, uh, and I, I think we were all pretty much agreed um, that school is not an appropriate term. But um, uh, there are implications to a, the apprenticeship learning system. Um, uh, it creates uh, closely uh, knit communities and, and the related social pressure, pressures uh, it, uh, of learning. And I don't think we've ex explored the, the implications of communities of practice uh, that are formed by appre apprenticeship uh, learning. And I think that's a direction um, that I think we should go um, in the future. So those are kind of my thoughts. And again, I wanna thank everyone for um, the papers. It was, it's really useful to see such a, a, a diverse uh, group of papers on um, different, um, on different uh, scribes in different places and different uh, data sets. Uh, and I really appreciate um, the careful way that I see the Qumran project um, applying digital uh, paleography and uh, its conclusions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. It's very interesting observations. You're right in antiquity. We often have very real problems with the, the data sets, right? We don't have the luxuries of those medievalists with 100,000 documents and all the 
information about the scribes and things, both, you know, the Arad issues, but even at Qumran, you bring up that point that, you know, how representative is our data set? And it's hard when it's just a small scraps. Thank you. So um, I would like now to uh, invite Hindi to the floor. Hindi, are you there? Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, uh, um, everyone. Um, thank you also for Bill and, and Sydney um, for your wonderful comments and reflections. And I also um, wanted to, to thank the people in the first discussion panel. Um, I think that what I have to say very much follows on from what you said. Um, and also just to emphasize the other side of the coin, um, if you like, that I think scholars of computation and digitization and paleography um, don't know how to read. I mean, in the way that we don't know how to do statistics. And it's a bit of a risk-taking thing to say, but I think it's extremely important that the work that we can bring to the other side um, is essential for a collaboration and what I'll call a reciprocal relationship that we need to move forward with. Um, and I don't mean it in, in a way, in any way that's um, condescending, but there are new ways of reading and thinking about reading practices and history of text and pluriformity, some of which Sydney and Bill and many others in this group have written about. Um, and we, we have to collaborate together um, so that um, what Brent said about, I produce a text for you, do I trust you? Well, do you know all of the work that was just done on a series of texts in the last 15 years? Um, and it's really standing beyond canonical divides. That's my informal response. And then my formal response will begin. Um, I wanna begin formally by thanking Mladen Popovich and Drew Longacre, along with Maruf, Gemma and Ihan for all of their work in creating um, a delightful and a dynamic forum for digital paleography and the study of scribal culture. It has been an incredibly exciting three days, human practices of analysis of reading and computerized possibilities of analysis of data when complementing one another can create new ways of accessing texts and traditions. The AI approach or the IA approach <laughs> is as good as the models created by the people who are trained as readers who have unanswered questions. So it's a matter then not of having the right answers. And here I think I'm pushing back a little bit with Daniel, um, uh, but rather it's the matter of asking the right questions. The presentations we have seen, I believe across these three very rich days have been about identifying correct starting points. I wonder what makes for suitable juxtapositions and then even further, what makes for compelling and cautious extrapolations. These have been three days of creative and innovative research that has yet to be integrated into our various disciplines and our own reading practices as scholars. This conference crossed the gap between the humanities and the social sciences, as well as traditional chronological divides between medieval, early modern, and ancient studies. Some of the medievalists in this very room have said to me in the past that we don't have a relationship between Dead Sea Scrolls and Cairo Geniza, for example, and yet they were here and they participated and they shared and gave insight to, um, to scholars from earlier periods and, and, and reciprocally um, the other way around, but also much closer to home. Um, I thank you, we thank you for bringing to the table innovative insights into digital paleography, material reconstruction, electronic editions, new approaches to dating manuscripts, hand recognition, scribal practices and cultures for the texts we work on and read. And that's not all. And I say it in a breathless way because I feel so excited and appreciative of everything of everything that you're doing um, um, for the field and for our ability to read. So now in the time that remains, I wanna raise some questions to the presenters and to the conference organizers. Um, and then at the very end, I wanna come back to the matter of meaning. <laughs> So how, first, how can all of this data help us to read and understand communities, help us to understand the lone scribe or the expert, or the one who's consulted as the master, the masquil, the sofer mahir, the mevin? To be sure we can grasp only fragmentary insights of reading practices, liturgical rituals and study. And I am thinking particularly in my own expertise of the Hebrew Bible and the Dead Sea Scrolls, but I believe that the implications are much wider from antiquity through medieval times and even beyond. Indeed, we are still operating with snapshots, not a running movie. In the construction of digital platforms, we have heard about a new concept of an edition, and so we can consider multiple editions. 
But what about integrating other research on text criticism and literary evidence that suggests we need a new concept of text? And here I wanna emphasize that it matters if we speak of a text or a manuscript or a tradition or a work. We need to be consistent, but of course we can't be systematic. And here I'm signaling some of the debates and conversations that happened earlier across the last few days. On the literary side or the hermeneutical side, we are realizing increasingly that what we need to do is to problematize the notion of a single or original text. Instead, in my own recent work, I've offered the notion of vitality and Jeffrey Kahn has offered um, a, a similar or analogous narrative about dynamic traditions, resisting an original text or a single Masoretic text, um, et cetera. Perhaps we can share our new insights so that this new concept of addition also integrates a new concept of text. This might also mean that we need to reflect more, and by we, I mean all of us, about whether reconstructing lacunae can actually be done from other texts, later texts, earlier texts. What should we or shouldn't we assume about existing canonical strictures? But even more, there is a need to see not just that there's an ongoing vitality that is ongoing from one generation to another, but that within each generation, the vitality needs to be relearned. And we saw this from Elihu, we saw it from Ibert, we saw it um, from Gemma and, we, and, and across, across, the, um, um, across the days. So education, paideia, um, pedagogy is important, both in terms of how text and interpretation are intertwined, but also in terms of skills that are part of pedagogy and training. I mean, here I have in mind the many conversations about unskilled or elementary or even past references to vulgar handwriting. The data reveal various kinds of pluriformity, especially on the one hand at the desk correction and improvement and clarification levels. But on the other hand, pluriformity can also be understood of the residue or what remains behind from multiple performances in didactic and liturgical settings. I mean, perhaps, you know, what Ian was speaking about, you can have both functions, even in a single, a single manuscript. And anyway, in any event, these are all rolled up, if you will, in anticipated functions. So when we reconstruct fragments, how do we take into account textual pluriformity? So for example, in the new joins that were presented, do we also use information about content and pluriformity? We increasingly come to understand variation in scriptural traditions such as Enoch, Jubilees, Jeremiah, and the Psalm scroll. How then does this affect the way we reconstruct texts? And here I'm speaking, I'm speaking on both sides of the divide, the humanities and the social sciences, if you will. On the question of scribal identity, what then is achieved in the identification of one hand or two? What do we know about the text with respect to composition or context? Can this new work have implications for how we read and understand the texts? Can we trace expressions of creativity, contribution and transformation amongst our newly identified or as Gemma just said, named scribes? Are we in danger of just transferring older concepts of authorship onto new innovative research? So, you know, is this then based on our search for the author or for authorial intention? And why is this important at all for meaning? Here I am suggesting from a distance that we recognize varying kinds of human authenticity and the assumptions to impose that we make to impose on our ancient and medieval works. How then? Another question, how then do we relate to what seems to be exemplars of the same composition? Or in other words, just because we have something that seems to fit in, in light of our textual and canonical expectations, does that mean that we have to fit it in or we should fit it in? Can we allow for more fluidity, creativity, poesis in these ancient and medieval texts? We, we know this from Piute, we know this from liturgical prayer, we know this from creative writing and rewriting. How will this impact our work in the digital humanities? The methodological assumptions about what a text is in a world where pluriformity and expansion are normally or regularly considered part of the compositional and, cop and copying processes should be rethought. And here I speak both to myself, to my colleagues, to my students, but also to the community here um, working in digital paleography. So I guess my, my ask, if I can dare to ask, is that there be a reciprocal rethinking about textuality and scribal practices with an eye towards growth of scriptural tradition that go well beyond commentary, 
across communities of philologists, that is philologists who are scholars of literature and material philologists as well. How can we integrate these projects, your new projects, into new understanding of scribal culture of antiquity all the way through medieval times and even in contemporary scribal practices? How can we use these new thousands of readings into a deepening of what it means to participate, perform, and to study these texts across centuries? It strikes me then that we have only just begun to consider reciprocally what kind of meaning we can give to data, genre, compositional practices, function, and working together to understand the text themselves, even when there are overlapping traditions in a single manuscript. These findings have the potential to transform our understanding of our expanding corpora of scriptures. Literary scholarship and material and digital scholarship can share new research and think together about implications for the work they are each advancing. And I leave you today with one thought. Texts do not have meaning without reading and performance. And to that end, I thank you and I want to continue to think with you for helping us get clearer about our texts and their processes of production through the digital humanities. Thank you. Thank you, Hindi, so much for bringing it to that broader perspective, just like we were hoping you would, to humanities at large. Very interesting to think about how our little bitty work in strokes and ink and little things really can eventually lead up to big uh, things in larger discussions in the humanities. Thank you so much. Now, um, Ibert, if you are here, you have a couple minutes. If you have anything you'd like to add, you've already had a uh, paper, but you're welcome. Is there any takeaways or reflections? Actually, that was exactly what I thought. I already had a paper, so why should I speak again? Um, a few comments. It struck me when I heard several contributions by James Moore, how much we are still in conversation with our pre pre predecessors from the 50s and the 60s and perhaps the 70s. And uh, this has two sides. This is on the one hand respect for what they have given us, but on the other hand, also we have to view them in, in what they wanted and in how they looked at this material you know, because you were often there, how often in Groningen we have been had discussions like, so why does Cross think this? And do we agree with him? And often we did not agree with him. And sometimes it was not clear why he thought this. And sometimes it was absolutely clear and we disagreed with him. So I think we are in all kinds of conversations. We are in conversation with the material, but we are also in conversation with our field and now, and this is a great uh, occasion that we have it, we are also in conversation with people who are working in different fields and we can come together. So I'm just repeating how I introduced Mladen at the very beginning, but this should be, this is for me programmatic and I think for Mladen also is, so on the one hand, how do we know what we know? And this is an ongoing discussion and uh, we can read so many colleagues and they state something and then Mladen describes me, so why do we think that? Or it goes the other way around. But the next question, and this is how digital paleography also comes in, is what do we need to know and what do we need to research for coming at new answers? I've heard a lot of statements these days and I thought, so how do we know that? Did anyone ever test it? How do we... Uh, Mladen at some point just asked the question, what is the weight of a scroll? And uh, how many scrolls could one carry at the same time? I think Sydney said, well, you took you several days to write this scroll, but a short scroll you could do in, in a day, Sydney, or in an hour, I forgot. But it's a day, good to a know. day. <laughs> Did you test it, Sydney? And, uh, no, no, but... Okay, I would like to know that. And yep. uh, so these are all Although kinds we of... can weigh the Isaiah scroll if we want to. So yeah, of course. <laughs> But basically, scientists would say we don't need to weigh them. We just need to know the, uh, I've got the English word, Lambert sortelijk gewicht. How do you say that in, in English? And the general weight of the material. And you know, the uh, you can calculate it exactly. So a scientist would never take, would never weigh it. Okay, so that is that. Um, 
as a last comment, very general, we, we are already 20, 30 years in an era where we are talking about material philology, where we are talking about scribal practices. And the last 10 years that has struck me more and more that what I think, and what I hope many of us think is the most important element for material philology and scribal practices, namely how one writes has not been addressed uh, sufficiently. So this is what we are doing here. So uh, just a few comments. Uh, Drew, back to you. Thank you. Uh, Mladen, you want to have a last couple words of reflection and then we'll open it up for more questions? Yes, thank you very much. Um, yeah, what to say, I mean, uh, maybe to keep it uh, and to draw everyone a bit in uh, how, we, how we have worked here throughout the years. Uh, and it has been a, for all of us an enormous process. You know, you don't get all this stuff uh, just overnight. And also this conference, and I really want to thank everyone already now, but, you know, it's been like a party. You know, we, we, we have a party and we invite all these great scholars everyone during these three days and now during this panel everyone sharing their thoughts and yeah this is this is amazing this is what it's about i think what we do we try to understand our data and then yeah the question is you know how do we know like with weighing a scroll uh sydney yes you're right uh, but many many years ago i i, I was in touch with uh, about this with with nina and i simply asked well can we weigh them how, how should we go about doing it because one thing is yes you can do it with the isaiah scroll but how actually are you going to do it and so on and so forth in any case um what I like about the things also being brought forward, not in the, only the previous panel, but also this one by, by Sydney and by Hindi and by Bill and, and, and by Ibert is, um, yeah, you know, if, if, we, if we bring it back to what is our data, what does Qumran stand for? And we've seen here, say, the sciences and the humanities, but of course, from the humanities side, there is already so much interdisciplinarity needed to understand Qumran. You know, literary studies, historical studies, archaeology, paleography, numismatics, and so on and so forth. And I don't think we can reduce Qumran and our data to only one characterization. You know, there are, there are multiple perspectives we see, both from literary, historical, archaeological, but also paleographical studies, as Ibert discussed today, you know, pointing to heterogeneity and diversity, and also pluriformity, as Hindi, Hindi remarked now in her uh, response. Now, this doesn't mean, I think, that it's just random or typical, you know, that it's going just one way or the other, but simply that there are more aspects than just one to which we cannot reduce Qumran. And yeah, what I'm interested in is in, in more nuanced approaches that open up uh, our ability to study more intricate connections and to get at a finer understanding of possible different subclusters or subcollections of manuscripts within the scrolls from, from Qumran. And yeah, this I also see is, is what is part of the history of scrolls research, you know. It's about the questions that we ask and understanding our data, our corpus. As, as Hindi also remarked, and also as Ibert said, I mean, we stand on the shoulders of giants. Uh, yes, we talked a lot about Cross, and we still do. And that's a testimony to the great work that he did, uh, which doesn't mean that we cannot move on. That's precisely the whole history of our research. We stand on the shoulders of giants and we move on. And it's an exciting way to do it, uh, not only with all these different disciplines, but uh, I think it was also Sydney who remarked that, you know, we went to the medieval period uh, and now Bill showed us Kuntilat uh, Ajrut and we had uh, before uh, also um, um, uh, Kayafa and so on and so forth. So it's fascinating to go throughout these thousands of years and then also sometimes come to a basic question of what is a scribe? Uh, and so we have in all these different concepts that we throw around, uh, multi-level analysis, I think, is needed. And, and that, for me, is, is the joy of these three days. And that, for me, is the joy of all these years working with this fantastic team here in Groningen and with all the people elsewhere and also conversing with colleagues elsewhere is this is a common enterprise. You cannot do this by yourself. At least I cannot. I mean, maybe there are much smarter people out there. They can do that. But I really think this, 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 this science, this scholarship that we do is a collaborative enterprise. We do it together. And um, yeah, I would uh, leave it at this for now. 
And later, I want to thank again everyone when, when closing down everything, but I think it's good to uh, open it up for everyone to uh, participate. Drew, I give it back to you. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you, everybody. Um, so at this point, our technical assistant, Andre, can go ahead and just uh, take all of the attendees who have been there, just make everyone a panelist, one big happy family. We only have 53 people who have survived to the end through the battle of attrition that is a three-day web conference. Um, as he starts transitioning people over, I have a couple reflections in light of what uh, our panelists have mentioned. One common theme, I think, that ties the, the reflections together is this question of, at least to me, a question that I have, the nature of typology and how does it work? So Sydney kind of reemphasized how we have this Crossian typology where you have early and late letters and it kind of develops and you see how a letter changes over time. Um, and then we also had a discussion earlier with Judith about the nature of typological change and how the innovation is often very individual, whereas you have to have some sort of authority or some sort of mechanism to create stylistic change. So uh, that's one thing that strikes me as we think about typology now in the digital age, at what point or how does it affect how we understand it? When we bring in this question, how linear is typology really, the development of handwriting? So a long time ago, Colette Sirot had already given that critique of cross thinking that, well, it, it seems like it, it creates a very linear trajectory. And it, to some extent, Mladen and the, the project here is suggesting similar that there's no one single line that's consistently followed uh, for typology. So th that question comes to mind in a, a digital age, how do we do typology if it's not entirely linear? And how does this community of practice that Bill was talking about fit into it? Um, and the, the second thing I, I'd like to put in there just on behalf of our computer science people to complete the loop here, for those of us, especially who those are the panelists who have not worked on the digital paleography projects, what do you think about this prioritization between trust and reliability and explainability when you, who are probably not going to be engaged in the detailed digital paleographic work on a project, but still find this very important to interact with, how do you personally prioritize those issues? Does any of the panelists have a response, either typology or the, the trust and reliability, explainability? Well, it, you know, when you asked that question, Drew, what came to my mind is when we get C14 dates, um, we basically understand how C14 dates are reached, but we as scroll scholars have no ability to reach C14 dates, right? We have to take the results that are found. We have to understand how to interpret those results, but we can't do it ourselves, right? We can't test for C14. And I think that, so we do have to have a certain amount of trust for our colleagues in different areas. Um, and I think as we learn more and more to collaborate across disciplines, that will get easier. Um, you know, in archaeology, um, collaboration is is just completely taken for granted with people in, who are uh, experts in different areas. And and so I think that we, as as tech scholars. Are, are moving more and more in that direction. So I, that's, a, that's a, just the thought that came to me as you asked that question. Hindi, I think you had a comment about that you said. Um, uh, there was a lot of discussion of trust in the first part of the panel and um, the people I trust, um, it's not just about the research they're doing, but it's also who they are and why they're doing the work they're doing as scientists, as literary scholars. Um, if I have a question about a fragment and how to assess information that's been disseminated, I go to Ibra Tichler. You know, I mean, <laughs> I mean that's and and it's because of and you know because of who Ibra is as a scholar and what his investment is. Um, 
and how unswayed he is by any kind of pressure. And I think, you know, people who 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 trust me or trust my training. I mean, we we it's very very individual, and collaborations are very, I think, um, individual. And and this is why I think creating a, a, our own interpretive community across the sciences and the, you know, Sydney talked about her teacher Frank Frank Moore Cross. You know, who we speak to. And you know, I was really struck. I mean, I'd not met Nahum before, but I was really struck Nahum by your presentation and the way you talked about the material and how you disseminate it. And I think that that's part of what this conversation is about. I think trust. Um, you know, it's trust is very, very personal. And I, I kind of want to put the, the human back into this conversation, um, both on the Wissenschaftlich side, as well as, you know, um, whatever we mean by humanities, which really under, fundamentally goes under the same, the same rubric. It's about, you know, expertise. I mean, Daniel's questions for Elihu were wonderful because Daniel wanted very, very specific. I thought they were some of the highlights of this conference. He wanted very, very specific questions about how long, how fast, you know, and for, for and to discuss about what happens with older scribes, with younger scribes, gender. I mean, these are, but this comes out of experience and out of trust and out of conversation. So I think that we cannot, we cannot, um, um, we cannot say enough about how important trust across individuals is and there's some people in this group who didn't always trust each other and there and this is something else that I saw was beautiful at this conference that that new trusts have been built across different digital projects which I think is also um, it's a kind of healing for the field because we need not just humanities and social sciences but we need the resources across the different projects right in Paris and in Haifa and in Groningen and you know and in Göttingen so I think that this is also what I what this is what I mean by trust. I mean, because of course I, you know, I, I you know, do we trust data? You know, do we trust an interpreter? I, perhaps the obvious answer is no. <laughs> Thank you, Hindi. I don't know if Bill had any questions or comments. Um, if not, I will move on to the next question we have from Ira Rabin. She wanted to ask a question, Ira. Actually, I didn't want to ask a question. I wanted to have a comment and I wrote that it was a comment and not a question. And uh, so may I? Yes, go ahead. Happy to hear what have you My comment instead go of a question. It. Go for it. Uh, well, maybe I can comment on what Sydney said. I think if Cross would look at us being a chemist, he would ask the same question I would want. I was wondering about. Why do we ignore the material of scrolls? I mean, physical material. The scrolls have their skins, right? The text is not written in the air. And you have just made uh, all the beautiful study of the age of this, of this uh, scrolls. But you know, we are speaking about comparing hands. We are speaking about um, comparing fragments. You know how much we can contribute by using material analysis? You know, it is quite known in, in the medieval uh, uh, paleography, or we call it advanced codicology, actually. We do a lot of, uh, the, usually when scribe changes, the hand changes, the ink changes. And we do look at different comments using the ink analysis, and it's been done now more than 20 for 20 years. Baum started doing it 20 years ago. But in the last five, six years, we are doing inks of the time which is comparable with the scrolls. And the whole work on the inks of the antiquity started with Genesis Apocryphon. Why Genesis Apocryphon had copper? And today, after studying a lot of different uh, papyri, parchments, we know that the first inks having metals Carbon plus metals appeared in the fourth century BC. So, and they go in, they have very different compositions. You would look at the compositions of the inks and it would help you to identify the scribes and to compare the scribes. It would add another criterion. We are talking about new technologies, but the technology that has been offered 50 years ago, the first was really, Reed finished his work on the scrolls and the material of the scrolls before I was born, and many of you were born. But we kind of 
currently we we want to ignore this and i i, I would like to attract attention of everybody here is that iaa yesterday uh, 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 said that they're going to study materials, they're going to study inks. At the Israel Museum, we had already plans to make the full analysis of the inks of Isaiah, or the great Isaiah scroll. I, I made here and there many analysis of the scrolls, of the inks of the scrolls. Why not use this information? Why not use, not add material scientists to your studies? You know, if I can, that's very good to, to note. I mean, there's, we've, we're talking specifically about scripts so much here. There is very much more. There's manuscripts. There's the, produce, the production of the parchment. And I don't think anyone's intentionally ignoring those kind of things. I just am not the one to do the chemistry. So it, again, it requires more collaborative projects, like you're saying. And I don't think anybody would deny that that's valuable. It's just something that still needs to be done in the future. And maybe it's not no, 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 not in the future, Drew. Not in the future. It's being done everywhere. Yeah. But in this conference, people were talking about all new technologies, ostensibly forgetting that the inks have composition. And that it is easy to really, it is non-destructive. You need much less effort than, than C14. Yeah, for sure. That's very, it's very interesting. And again, I don't think anyone would deny that even though we are not focusing on that, there's certainly value to it. My question to you, Ira, would be, um, when you think about the ink and you think about the parchment, when it comes to the question that we're asking about writer identification, how much of that do you think is relevant to the person who actually put pen to paper? Is this something that would have been produced in a workshop where they produced ink and sold it? Or does each scribe make his own ink? Because that has an effect on the questions we're asking and how the chemistry fits. Well, if you can, I can tell you that in Egypt, in the first, second, third century BC, the inks were bought on the market. We have prices and we know the composition and we know that the people were actually using the, the uh, inks according to the pocket they had, so to say, they got the money. But what we are doing, the scribes in uh, uh, of the of in, and I don't believe the scribes of Qumran, honestly. I think that all this is a, the everything has been brought from somewhere else. But if you see we, today, we have at least five scrolls checked with the inks, different inks, with inks with metals. And again, if you look at the Jane Sepulchre, it was made somewhere else. We have to go through the whole collection and then we'll see how similar the inks are. I can tell you, I can tell you only about the areas that we studied. We studied Egypt, we studied Fayum, we studied, uh, I think James would say more about Elephantine because they are studying Elephantine. That's the only project I know that they're using XRF. But yeah, about the, the, the Qumran, you need to study them. At least five scrolls have uh, metals in the inks. And you have the, the Engedi scroll. Engedi scroll was even red because there is metal. However, interesting moment, no one knows which metal it was because no one asked, no one studied, no one checked. I wrote the article on the Leviticus scroll recently and the, one of the inks was one of the, the criterion. And I, I recognize that the development of carve or the iron gall inks, you know, is supposed to be third to fourth century, but there are earlier metals in, like you're saying. And I, as I don't know, it's I pointed out as something that needs further investigation. So there's an example of paleographic work that is dependent on the ink, even though it's in an area where we just don't have the data yet. So hopefully you'll get me that data, right, Ira? If we start working on it, if if you are interested, we, we material sciences are pushed aside. We can leave a, and another last thing about the trust. The whole thing of training is because trust is very good, but checking is better. And you cannot say, I trust my friend Frank and I will trust what he did, but I distrust my, my non-friend someone else. We're making, we're doing training for everybody to understand how the things work. And we uh, uh, scientists get training in paleography, or ecology, and everything which is needed to understand what the scholars do, to be to, to contribute. So I guess training is, is the answer to the trust. We'll definitely have to do some more training then. Thank you so much, Ira. Um, 
Uh, Hussein, you had a, a quick comment you said. No, I didn't. Well, I I told you that uh, Hindi already mentioned the point that I wanted to continue. Sorry, I missed that crucial so, thing in the chat. Thank you, Hindi. <laughs> Sorry, Drew, to interrupt. Like, Isabel wants to comment something on Ira's comment. Yeah. Yes, I, I thought that was Hussein's point. Uh, so just very shortly, the workshop that will be organized in September welcomes also uh, science, uh, natural science specialists. So we try to combine the three fields of uh, computer science, uh, paleography, and natural science for the analysis of material. And so we really hope to have abstracts and papers by May 10, <laughs> so spread the world. And abstracts will be on, on, on future possible um, work and research work. So if you have an interesting material and you would like to, to set the issue to the community, you are welcome to submit an abstract. So don't hesitate to contact either Hussein or me. And uh, Ira, if uh, you have a good result with carbon ink, please tell me <laughs> because I know metal ink is spreading, but I'm 95% I'm carbon ink. So don't oh, forget but, to let me know. Well, Isabel, you have worked with Tia, so you know how much car uh, carbon ink has metal, so. Okay. Um, I want to pass it off to Mladen to finish, but we have one final question. Um, we have Bronson, if you want to finish your last question to finish us off, and then we'll let Mladen close up the conference. Are you there, Bronson, still? Yeah, but I don't think I have a last question. Did I say I did? We're going to get an answer, so no. Okay, never mind. Thank you all very much. I love the country. Thank you. Take us away. Yeah, uh, I'm so sorry that we have to uh, yeah, uh, stop this fascinating discussion and conversation. The point is, here in the Netherlands, we still have a curfew. And we are in the building of science and engineering here, and we have to get home in time. So <laughs> we really have to stick to the eight o'clock uh, because of the COVID measurements here. In any case, uh, as I said uh, earlier on, I want to thank everyone uh, for their wonderful contributions and for the discussions and uh, for the wonderful presentations. And uh, there's a lot of uh, things uh, we will continue and we can take home and think about. And uh, I hope uh, this uh, has at least succeeded, and I find that very important, of building bridges uh, between disciplines, between uh, 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 colleagues, uh, and uh, also for, for future work to explore our own uh, field of studies, but also to have learned from other fields of studies. And I want to thank all of you very, very much. And uh, as you know, these things were recorded, and they will be put uh, online. Uh, in a few weeks or so, uh, and I don't know if we are able to contact everyone, but uh, we'll make it known and you can uh, listen back to everything uh, if you want. So thank you very, very much to everyone. And I want to especially thank again, as at the start, uh, the uh, my team here, uh, Ihan, Gemma and Maruf, but especially Drew, who did an enormous amount of work of setting the whole conference up and uh, making it all possible. So Drew and the others, thank you very, very much. You are fantastic. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Take care and, and stay healthy and be well and hope to see you soon in real life. Bye-bye.